to say something this evening session that relates to the hymn we've sung naturally enough, the words that we sang in opening of that hymn, how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. I want us to ask and positively answer the question, can we trust the Old Testament of our Bibles? We're grateful to people like F.F. F. Bruce and Josh McDowell for giving us excellent resources whereby we can confirm very plainly the reliability of the New Testament scriptures. I'd like us to spend a little time this evening looking at what others have researched that can give us the utmost confidence in the Old Testament of our Bibles. And I'm pleased to note that our young friends here who are going through the education system and they will meet the challenges that we're going to refer to. And so the question we're looking at this evening as we're together is can we trust the Old Testament? Can we trust it when it describes a faithful and merciful creator? You see, we ask the question because Sir David Attenborough is often asked why he doesn't credit a creator God for the wonderful animal designs that he demonstrates so well in his programs. And he replies, I tend to think instead of a parasitic worm boring through the eye of a boy sitting on a river bank somewhere in Africa. A worm that's going to make him blind. And then I ask those people who are quizzing me, are you telling me that the God that you believe in, who cares for each one of us, created this worm that can live in no other way than in the eyeball of an innocent child? Because, he says, that doesn't seem to me to coincide with a God who's full of mercy. Actually, I'm told his response is not entirely accurate in saying that that particular parasitic worm can live in no other way than in the eyeball of that child. But leaving that lesser point aside, can we focus on the main point that he's raised there, the main objection? You see, Genesis chapter 1 and verse 31, the conclusion of that opening chapter of our Bibles, says that after God's creative acts, he pronounced his entire creation very good. Which can only mean that situations such as Attenborough has described are not of God's making. And that, of course, brings us to the text of Genesis chapter 3, which tells us that through one man, sin entered into the world. If Genesis chapter 3, which as you know well is the account of the Garden of Eden and how in that pristine paradise human rebellion resulted in the imposition of a curse from God. If that account of Genesis chapter 3 is regarded as being untrustworthy, then the logical consequence of that is that which has been given vent to by Stephen Fry. When he was being interviewed in an Irish station for a television programme called The Meaning of Life, he was asked, what would you say to God if you had a chance to speak to him? And he said these words. He said, I'd say, bone cancer in children. What's that about? How dare you create a world in which there is such misery that's not our fault? It's not right. It's utterly, utterly evil. Why should I respect a God who creates a world so full of injustice and pain? Actually, his language was far more intemperate than that. And led, if you recall, him coming under investigation under a possible charge of blasphemy. But Stephen Fry would there be appearing to express moral outrage. 
And it's fair to ask, where does that sense of morality arise from that he's expressing, albeit in a distorted way? The best answer has to be it comes from God, the God who's revealed in Scripture, the God who truly does exist, of course. But his is a distorted morality for sure. It's distorted by suppressing the truth. The truth of Genesis chapter 3, for example, suppressing it in unrighteousness. But if Genesis chapter 3 is held to be untrustworthy, then the logical consequence is indeed what Stephen Fry has expressed. For if we don't believe in that passage of Scripture, then there's no free will defence. When we are asked to give account for the reason why the world today is in the state that it's in. With the help of Genesis chapter 3, we can point to God's original creation being perfect. And humankind having been given free will. And through the deceiver coming into the garden, and our first parents being deceived and disobeying God, that act of human rebelliousness brought the imposition of the curse that leaves the world in the state, ultimately, that it's in today. But you see, if that is not regarded as a trustworthy account, then God is made out to be the author and architect of pain and disease and death in our world. But that's only if we don't accept Genesis chapter 3, a text in Scripture which is, of course, corroborated by the New Testament in Romans 5 and verse 12. Through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and death passed to all men, for that all sin, the original sin. You know, it's the most empirically um, proven doctrine of all Scripture. We pick up the newspaper on any day, and we'll see evidence that is consistent with the Bible's teaching from Genesis 3 of original sin. Let's open our Bible, shall we? But we will open to the New Testament. But it's commentary there, and commentary by our Lord on the Old Testament. So please, Mark's Gospel, chapter 10. And we'll read from verse 5, verses 5 and 6. Mark 10, verses 5 and 6. But Jesus said to them, Because of your hardness of heart, he, that's Moses, wrote you this commandment. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Shall we go to chapter 12? We'll come back and comment on these verses, of course. But verse 26, the Lord here, debating not with Pharisees this time, but with Sadducees on the issue and topic of the resurrection. And he says, regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. He's not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken. And two verses, please, in John chapter 5, continuing readings in the Gospels and words spoken by our Lord Jesus Christ. The end of John chapter 5. Jesus speaking here to disbelieving Jews, and he says to them, For if you believe Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? So the Lord said there in our first reading in Mark 10, Moses wrote you this commandment. I want to come back to that in a moment. But first, a brief aside, please. Because in the remainder of that verse, the Lord spoke and said, From the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. Notice Jesus didn't say at the very end of a very long process of creation. But from the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And yet the education system in our schools is likely to tell our children 
that it was brought about by a very long process. Of course, the education system doesn't trust the Old Testament of our Bibles. But regrettably, neither, it seems, do many theological faculties and Christian seminaries. Take this question, very basic question. Did Moses write or edit the first five books of the Bible? The Bible itself says that he did in four places. We'll go to the first five books themselves, the Pentateuch. There God says to Moses, that time in Exodus chapter 34, verse 27, when he calls Moses up to the mountain yet again to replace the broken stone tablets with the Ten Commandments, he says, write down these words, Moses. These words of the covenant, Moses, you, write them down. When you come to Numbers chapter 33, verse 2, Moses, it says, wrote down the starting points of every stage in their journeyings through the desert. And then when you come to Deuteronomy, to take another of the five books, at the end of that book in chapter 31, verse 19, God says to Moses, Moses, I want you to write down a song. It'll be a teaching song for future generations among the people of God, to warn them. So the Pentateuch makes it very plain that Moses was writing. But then when you come to the rest of the Old Testament, Joshua, as they come into the Promised Land, and when he's fulfilling what Moses had been instructed, when he set up an altar at Mount Ebal, and he's pronouncing the blessing on Gerizim and the curse on Ebal, it says there that Joshua connected the book of the law with Moses. In fact, it says in chapter 8, verse 32, very emphatically, that Moses wrote it. Well, later in history, if you come to the time when the exiles have come back from the land of Babylon under Ezra's leadership, and Ezra's giving them guidelines for right living before God as the people of God, Ezra is guiding them by what he calls the book of Moses in Ezra 6 and verse 18. Then we come to the New Testament. And we've already seen from our reading in Mark 12, 26, that the Lord Jesus speaks about the incident of the burning bush being found in Moses' book. And he says to those disbelieving Jews, as we've mentioned at the end of John chapter 5, when they were scratching for stones to put him to death because they perceived that he was indeed making himself equal with God. He said to them, if you had believed Moses, you would believe me, for he wrote about me. And fourthly, other New Testament writers throughout the New Testament make the same observation that Moses was the one responsible for the first five books in our Bible. For example, Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 15 said that whenever Moses is read, a veil is lying upon their hearts. So these things are indisputable. There's zero wiggle room if we accept the Bible as God's inspired word, inerrant in its original writings. But there's a different idea around. And you'll meet it whenever you pick up a commentary. And it's called the documentary hypothesis. Liberal Bible colleges teach this and some supposedly conservative Bible schools also. It was a hypothesis, an idea, made popular by a man called Wellhausen at the end of the First World War. And it basically says that the first five books of the Bible had content that was too sophisticated for early humans, whom he supposed could not write. Preferring human philosophy over God's word, this viewpoint of Wellhausen is saying that the Old Testament, in effect, is a literary fraud. Wellhausen was wrong in every way. For the devout believer... Our Lord Jesus' personal endorsement of the Old Testament is totally sufficient for us. But for the skeptic, it's useful to note that there are 11 verses 
throughout the book of Genesis, which read, these are the generations of, or words to that effect. You trace them. And the word generations is a translation of the Hebrew word toledoth. It can also mean history. And each verse containing it, as you go through the book of Genesis, comes either before or after the segment of history associated with the person named in that verse, alongside the word Toledoth. The most likely explanation is that Adam, Noah, Shem, etc., each wrote an account of the events that occurred during his lifetime. And then Moses, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, selected, compiled, and edited these to produce the book of Genesis. Much like Luke in the New Testament collated eyewitness reports and he brought them together under the operation of the Holy Spirit to give us an orderly account of the things that most surely happened. And that knowledge from those early characters in Genesis was preserved through the flood in Noah's day. Ah, but you see that raises another problem, doesn't it? Some Christian seminaries now teach that the Bible account of the flood was written much later. And it was based on an earlier Mesopotamian story from some pagan belief system. We don't have to study religious education very far in school to come across those ideas that are put forward as undeniably true. But it's all based on Wellhausen's fundamental error that we've already mentioned, his tragic error of judgment, his so-called documentary hypothesis, that the first five books of the Bible had been written and compiled much later in history, well after the events that they describe. It's assumed by those liberal scholars that the Pentateuch was compiled by priests during the Babylonian exile of God's people in the 6th century BC when they were in Babylon and influenced by flood stories of a Mesopotamian origin. You know, this is simply cannon fodder for enemies of biblical Christianity who gleefully assert that the biblical account is just pure fiction based on myths and legends, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh. Richard Dawkins warms to that theme in his latest book, entitled Outgrowing God. What an arrogant title for a man to write on the cover of his book, Outgrowing God. He states, as if it's an undeniable fact that Genesis was written during the Babylonian captivity. You see, that's following Wellhausen's error. And Dawkins confuses the plot of the flood story found in the Epic of Gilgamesh with another flood story at an earlier era in Mesopotamia. Another flood story. But whichever of these two flood stories he's talking about, whatever he was thinking of, neither of them are arguably the oldest piece of written literature in this world. In short, Dawkins gets the language of the story wrong. He gets the date of the story wrong. He conflates two flood stories as if they are one and the same, and they're not. It's all poor quality research. It's like the kind of evidence they brought at the Lord's mock trial false testimony that was not even consistent among itself. And the delicious irony here is Dawkins is alleging inaccuracies in the word of God. And he can't even be accurate with his own sources in the charges that he falsely brings. This is a type of proud human reasoning that opposes the true knowledge of God. And 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 tells us we are to destroy that. Let's do it. To begin with, I'm sure you are aware 
that there are flood traditions all over the globe from diverse people groups that seemingly come from the source which is Genesis chapter 6 through to chapter 9. Is that the original? Well, we can test this, I believe. The Bible's ark was built to be tremendously stable. God told Noah to make it 300 by 50 by 30 cubits. 300 in length, 50 in breadth, 30 cubits in height. That's very roughly 150 metres by 25 metres by 15 metres tall. If you can work in old money for a second, that's just over one and a half million cubic feet of capacity. That's enormous. As some of the young people here discovered for themselves at Northwest Summer Camp this year, they were asked to get measuring tapes and measure out the size of Noah's Ark. And there wasn't enough space on the field to accommodate it. The Disneyfied cartoon type pictures of a big bathtub with some garden shed stuck on top and two giraffes looking over the side. That's enemy propaganda. It's designed, sometimes at least designed, to state that the status of what we're dealing with here is some kind of fairy story. It didn't really happen. But in approximating the dimensions that we've given, that scripture gives, into modern units. I've kept the same ratio between them because this is precisely the correct ratio to keep a barge such as Noah's Ark from capsizing, even in rough seas. You know, there are three main types of rotation in ships. You get the rotation where the bow and the stern go alternately from left to right and the vessel weaves its way. You get the kind of motion or rotation when the bow and the stern alternately rise and fall and the vessel's pitching. And you get the kind of rotation which is the most dangerous of all for a seagoing vessel, which is sideways rotation. The vessel tilting one way and then the other in danger of capsizing completely on its side from which there can be no recovery. So rolling is by far the greatest danger. And the ark solves that by being far wider than it is tall. It's virtually impossible to tip over such a vessel as described in scripture. Even if it was tipped to an angle of 60 degrees, it's been shown that it could right itself. David Collins, a naval architect, has shown that even a three times hurricane force wind could scarcely roll the ark by more than three degrees which is far less than 60 degrees. And what's more, Korean naval architects have independently confirmed that this set of ratios is the optimum design for a seagoing barge. Now, contrast that with the ark in those Mesopotamian stories. Theirs was a huge cube. It's hard to think of a more ridiculous design for a ship. It's one that would roll over at the slightest disturbance. You can make legends out of history, but you can't make history out of legends. Let's read Luke chapter 17, please. We're still on the flood at the time of Noah. Luke chapter 17. Our Lord's commentary referring to that. Verse 26. He says, and just as it happened in the days of Noah, so it will be also in the days of the Son of Man. They were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying, they were being given in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Hardly anything in the Bible has been attacked as much as God's cataclysmic judgment of Noah's flood. It all started with a man called James Hutton, who in 1785, a Scottish physician, he declared 
The past history of our globe must be explained by what we can see happening now. Notice, that's not based on any evidence. He said that before he got to looking at the evidence, and he just ruled the Old Testament completely out of court by his own decree. We're going to understand the past, not by divine revelation, not by treating the Old Testament as trustworthy, but by what we can see happening now before our eyes in the present day world. And sadly, that approach has become so entrenched that many Christian colleges don't teach the flood. But Jesus taught it as history, as real as his future second coming. Just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will also be in the days of the Son of Man. Jesus takes Noah as being a real person, the ark as being a real vessel, and the flood as being a real event. These same words of our Lord rule out compromises such as the idea that perhaps it was just a local flood. If that was all that had happened, then God hasn't kept his promise, because there have been many local floods since then. And if that was all that took place, if it was a local flood, then by analogy, the Lord's own analogy, his second coming will only be a local event. Or why didn't God simply tell Noah to move to an adjacent region to be safe from this local flood? Because after all, that's what he did with Lot, wasn't it? When he brought a local firestorm against the cities of the plain. Lot just needed to migrate nearby. But liberals who care nothing for Jesus' words would go even further, wouldn't they? Scholars among them disagree with our Lord about Adam being the first man at the very beginning of God's special creation. But does it matter? Just believe in the spiritual truths that Jesus taught us in the New Testament. That's what many people settle for. Because we've all heard arguments that defend the reliability of the New Testament. But the same kind of arguments defend the Old Testament also. I think we know that the find of the Dead Sea Scrolls allowed comparisons of copies of the Old Testament text to be made with copies that were a thousand years older a remarkable confirmation. The result was essentially no difference. God had watched over his word to preserve it. We've probably heard of Francis Collins. He was the head architect of the Human Genome Project and did tremendous work relating diseases to particular genes, very helpful. But he's established a foundation known as BioLogos. And I was noticing on its website, very prominently at the head of the website, there's an endorsement by Tim Keller. I know there are people here who would listen to podcasts by Tim Keller and be influenced. I'm disappointed to find Tim Keller endorsing that particular foundation, the BioLogos Foundation. Because while they admit that Jesus affirmed a straightforward view of Genesis creation and the flood, they claim he was wrong in doing so. This error with the Old Testament comes from a very basic and serious error with the person of our Lord Jesus Christ himself. You see, they think that our Lord's emptying himself, as we've had reference to in Philippians chapter 2 earlier today, allowed for the Lord in his humanity to mistakenly endorse a plain reading of Genesis creation and the flood. You see what they're doing? They're confusing limitation with misunderstanding. They're confusing an adaptation to our human level with an accommodation to human error. These are very different things. Our Lord could never be mistaken. He could never misunderstand. 
and he could never accommodate to human error. And when he agrees with Genesis, then both are correct. We started with Genesis and the credibility of its teaching. Does it matter, we ask? The answer's got to be yes. Because as we've seen, it touches not only on the credibility of the whole Old Testament, and indeed the credibility of the whole of Scripture, because the Gospel narrative builds on early Genesis, but it also touches most definitely on the proper honour due to our Lord Jesus. The Bible can be trusted at all points, on all topics, or else on none. Due to it being the inspired word of God, its authority trumps any other authority. How dare anyone, certainly any one of us, prefer a secular authority and find that voice to be more trustworthy and convincing than God's word found in Scripture? You know, the best authorities agree with Scripture. I'm thinking of Arno Penzias, Nobel Prize winning scientist. He said this, The best data we have are exactly what I would have predicted had I nothing to go on but the five books of Moses and the Psalms and indeed the whole Bible. I think you could go so far as to say that in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, based on Penzias' statement, we have there the most up-to-date statement on origins on the planet today. If you've not read Professor Edgar Andrews' book, Who Made God?, published by Evangelical Press, first in 2009, third print edition in 2016, I would recommend it as a rebuttal to the wrong arguments put forward by the likes of Dawkins. What Professor Andrews does in one small part of that excellent book is he takes the first ten words of the Bible. In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. Ten words. And he says, let's just take that as our hypothesis. Let's call it our God hypothesis. He's thinking like a scientist. And he says, if that is true, what would we expect to find in our world today? What would be the predictions from this hypothesis that we should be looking to see if they are fulfilled? And he lists six of them. And they're all overwhelmingly fulfilled in our world today in the wonders of modern science. He's taking such things as, if the first ten words of the Bible are true and trustworthy, then you would expect scientists to be able to go out and study the universe and describe it by means of certain laws. Because it would be an orderly system if it's the product of a rational mind, of a superintelligent. And that, of course, is what we do discover. Science wouldn't work if that wasn't its fundamental supposition. In fact, the most famous scientist ever probably is Albert Einstein. And he is on record as stating the most incomprehensible thing about the universe is that it is comprehensible. It's only an incomprehensible thing if you don't start with the Genesis God hypothesis. Otherwise, it's what you expect to find. And indeed, all the major predictions that we could expect, if Genesis 1 and 1 is true, are validated through modern science today. So I want us at the close of our conference, to stand on God's word. It's Psalm 11 and verse 3 that asks the question, if the foundations are destroyed, what shall the righteous do? The next verse gives the answer, of course, doesn't it? It says, there's no need for despair. God is on his holy throne. God is in his temple. And his throne is in heaven. And there we take our refuge. Human foundations may crumble. 
but God's foundation will never be destroyed. So we began by singing how firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his most excellent word. What more can he say? Indeed, what more can God say than he said in his word? It was Billy Graham in the later years of his ministry that I read saying that after the 9-11 event, when the World Trade Towers were destroyed, completely destroyed, the foundations under the ground were still intact. And had the American people wanted to do so, they could have rebuilt those twin towers. But out of respect for the dead, they left it and turned it into a garden of remembrance. The building completely destroyed, the foundations still intact. You know, it was the same with Solomon's magnificent temple. The Babylonians raised it to the ground, but the foundations were still intact. Ezra chapter 6 and verse 3 tells us the exiles came back and they built on the existing foundations. Early Genesis is not only first, but it's foundational. It's first because it is foundational. The Bible stands on those early texts. And we build in the 21st century where our Lord Jesus built in the 1st century. The Judeo-Christian faith and worldview cannot be built on any other foundation than the foundation of Scripture, the Old Testament, and its earliest verses. I'm reminded in closing of the words of Francis Schaeffer, who spoke about the skeptics and said, they have their feet firmly planted in midair. It's Christians who believe the word of God that have got their feet on solid ground. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. The skeptics are in midair. But we'll finish with a word of scripture. Psalm 93 says the flood has lifted up. The floods have lifted up their voice. The floods have lifted up their mighty waters. But mightier is God. Mightier than the sound of many waters. Mightier than the mighty breakers of the sea. The Lord is mighty. Your testimonies are fully confirmed. Your testimonies are very sure. I picture those verses of that psalm in relation to the material we've been covering. Over centuries, over millennia, wave after wave of attack has come against the word of God. But the bedrock, the bulwark of scripture stands firm. God's testimonies are fully confirmed and we can trust, yes, the Old Testament of our Bible, the whole of God's word. We thank God for the firm foundation that we have for our faith in his excellent